This is eyada.com. Primetime sports all the time. And now from Times Square, crossroads of the World Wide Web, and sponsored in part by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, it's the Wrestling Observer Live with Dave Meltzer. How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. we got Brian Alvarez here. We also are going to have Rick Bassman, the uh, head train, um, the owner of Ultimate Pro Wrestling, which is, of course, a wrestling school and independent wrestling promotion in Southern California that runs... Uh, basically once a month at the um, Galaxy Theater, a lot of publicity for their shows because they put them up on the web live. They had Rob Van Dam against Christopher Daniels on the last show. This next show will be on the 21st, which is this coming Wednesday, so we'll be talking a little bit about that show in the Northern California versus Southern California feud. We've actually had a lot of those people that are uh, in that match, uh, Mike Modest, Donovan Morgan, Tony Jones, the Northern California group. We've had on this show several times. Um, all three of them in, in recent weeks, and uh, Chris Daniels uh, from the other side, Chris Daniels, uh, Mikey Henderson, and Tom Howard representing Southern California. We'll talk a lot about that. If you are interested in wrestling schools, Rick Bassman's a good person to talk to, and we can just talk about the WWF. They've uh, see if there's anybody new that they've got into the WWF. They're kind of a feeder territory to the WWF. Talk about progress of different people and all that good stuff. Of course, Brian's here for the next two hours as well. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. I think uh, first thing we can talk about, I guess we should start with with Thunder, which I um, I think I got through a, a little bit of the show. I was out all night last night, and I came home and um, fell asleep actually. But it was really late. It's not like the show was necessarily boring or anything. But I didn't get a chance. Just so much happened this morning. I didn't get a chance to watch most of it. Um, I got through. Um, I think I'm through Kui Wee and Mike Sanders was the last match I saw. So what what were your thoughts before that and after that as well? Actually, right in the middle of the Mike Sanders Kiwi match, I was just thinking to myself, you know, AJ Styles is like the second best guy in the show so far. It was like it was a total indie showcase for about the first hour of the show. Uh, the first match I thought was pretty good. Uh, I thought AJ Styles looked good. Thought Air Paris looked pretty green, and his gear didn't help him out any. Sean O'Hare and Mark Jindrak was just. Uh, I got a lot to say about that match. I feel kind of like a fool because I remember saying at one point, you know, these power plant guys can have good matches each together because they work out in the power plant together. Well, I was wrong. That was not. And then they had then they had Sanders and Kiwi, and it was which was better at least. It was better, but it was still pretty bad. Yeah. And uh, Mike Awesome and Ernest Miller was absolutely hideous. Okay, well that 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 I didn't get to yet. Chavo Jr. in the Wall versus Ray and Hugh Morris. This is like the first time in the show that the crowd cared about absolutely anything. They got behind Ray when he was doing his big comeback, but Ray's just such an awesome baby face. And, you know, they pop huge for that. It was actually an okay match, but they don't need Ray in there with Wall, for sure. He just looked absolutely tinier than ever. Bagwell and Conan was pretty bad. Jared and Rick Steiner versus Paige and Dustin Rose was pretty bad in the main event. And Overall, I thought uh, that was a real bad show. Okay. Um... They have a lot to look forward to in that uh, second hour. Wow. And what else do I? Yeah, and I got, so we got SmackDown tonight. Uh, let me see. The first match, I see. I saw some potential in AJ Styles, but you know, it's such a big jump from working those indie shows to working national television, and and it was just so obvious watching from from a facial standpoint. You know, he didn't know how to play the camera at all. Yeah, he did look kind of like a robot. Um. You know, athletically, you know, he did a cool, some cool moves, but, I mean, he really wasn't ready, and then there, there you are on national television. Air Paris, um, physically, it's tough. That one's tough, boy. Boy, because I'd never, I'd never seen him before. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I've heard about him for the last, you know, two years. And, I mean, he did some nice moves and everything, but um, just very small, and, and he had very minor league-looking look. Um, I Jamie Noble. wearing this outfit that's baggy on him. Yeah. And it makes him look even smaller. It's like, you know, you're skinny when you wear spandex and it's loose. Yeah. Um, Jamie Noble was so awesome in that match. Oh, yeah, he's awesome. I mean, it, it, it was, you know, you know that he looks with his hair and everything. If you don't really look close, he looks like Kaz Hayashi. And, like, from, from, like from far away, right? Uh-huh. And, like, 
like I was watching from far away for about a minute, and I'm going like, boy, that Kaz Hayashi's awesome. And then I kind of like walked up a little bit closer to the TV, and it was Jamie Noble, and you know he was awesome for the re that guy is, that guy is really good. Yeah, yeah. And that match, you know, and then um, um O'Hare and Jindrak, I mean, my thought watching this was they need to, you know, those guys are good athletes. They're they're huge men that are very agile. And they couldn't work together at all. And they're like tag team partners. They've been together for a long time. And they need, I mean, I mean desperately, especially because we all talk about Sean O'Hare and, you know, the potential that Sean O'Hare has. And, and, and Jindrek, I, I don't know, there's something about facially, he doesn't do it for me. But I don't want to knock him because he's like probably 6'5". And good condition, obviously. Look, I mean, looks good physically. Uh, he can do some great athletic moves out there. So there's something there. I mean, the charisma's not quite there yet. But these guys, they, they need to send these guys, I've, I've kind of mentioned something on their website about this, they need to send these guys to Japan and, and get, get them off TV for like a year. Because at the way, the, at least as WCW is now structured, um, the nature of that company is, is you're going to be running one show a week, and these guys are only going to get, you know, how much better are they going to get with, um, let's say, 52 matches over the next year, most of which go... Let's say five minute average. I know, and think of honky tonk man. He's talking about working 120 days a year. I know, but I mean, I think that like these, you know, you know, people are going to get this impression of of Sean O'Hare as this guy who's you know just not ready. Yeah. Because they're going to see him at this point, and I mean, you, granted, you can all say, well, we saw you know Rock, like literally Rock was in the major leagues from day one, but Rock doesn't count. He doesn't count, okay? <laughs> and I don't even think Rock, Rock looked like uh, this anyway. No, but then the other thing with Rock is also, Rock in his first year probably worked 200 matches. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was like he, you know, he had his chance to develop. I think that if they sent those guys to Japan where they're working five nights a week, and like all those Japanese wrestlers are really good technical wrestlers. Um, I mean, I remember Robbie Rage and um, the other guy, Kenny Chaos, when they went to Japan for like three tours. They came back and they were, they had improved so much, and of course then... We never heard from them since, but that's another story. Um, one of them got hurt. I don't even know what happened to Kenny, Kenny Chaos. Robbie tore his bicep. Then they got rid of him. Then they Became rehired the him. Became man briefly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, but I mean they improved greatly, and I think that if those guys had a chance, you know, all of those guys, instead of putting them on TV before they're ready, you know, even better than working in independent, because the, the thing with the New Japan is working in independence. You know, there's not that many veterans they're going to work with. Yeah, they'll get the ring time. But, I mean, like, oh, and I, I mean this more with O'Hare than anybody else, is that if he were to go, say that you've got Sean O'Hare's like a real project where you really think that this guy can do something, and, and everyone seems to think that, and I, I do too. Send him there, leave him there for a long time, and then when you bring him back, give him a huge push, give him a good look, and, and maybe he's a, he'll be at least a Mike Awesome when he comes back. Maybe. Maybe if you're lucky. You know, uh, rather than, I mean, because... Those guys, man. Not I mean, Mike Awesome last night, but in general. Well, I didn't see Mike Awesome. Well, Mike Awesome it can, is not good with a bad worker. I mean, Mike Awesome Mike Awesome has great matches when he's in there with a great worker, and when he's in there with bad people, he he doesn't look good. I mean, that's always been his case. But um, you know, I watched O'Hare, and I'm I mean, when I was watching that match, I'm going like, this guy is doing himself no favors. This is not helping him, and and it's really sad because you know he's the prototype of of what they need in main events in yeah. like a year, and in like and, and in a year. Of working five minute TV matches once a week as opposed to going on the road every night, uh, you're going to get better. Mm -hmm. uh, or he's not going to get enough better. I mean, he'll get better, but he won't get better fast enough to where, he's, where he can be a main eventer in a year, put it that way. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you made me really encouraged to watch the rest of that show. Uh, you got to watch Ernest Miller, Mike Awesome. Well, I will. I'm going to do that. As soon as the show's over, I'm going to watch the rest. This part is the finish is uh, Miller goes for a kick and he kicks the post. With, like, his foot, right? And he falls down in pain, and about, uh, he just sells it the rest of the match. Like, 30 seconds later, he's holding his shin, and about, uh, 30 seconds after that, he's holding his knee, and, uh, it's just so hokey. It's like, is this pain moving up your leg? Is it gonna get to your pelvis soon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Missy Hyatt's book is due in July or August. It's going to be called First Lady of Wrestling. The original sexy sidekick tells all. So we'll probably have her on the show probably more than once between now and that book release, I got a feeling. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the weirdest story. This is like, you know, what, what, 
when I grew up and when I the journalism I studied it does not exist anymore. <laughs> That's all I can say. This WZZN FM in Chicago has banned any references to the XFL on its station. The reason is is because the XFL officials of the Chicago Enforcers had um, told them that they were going to buy ads on the station. So the station got totally behind them and was talking about them like crazy. And then they backed out of the ad buy, so the station will not allow any of its people to even mention the XFL, like any of their sports talk guys. That's good. I mean, that is so bad. That's just like the, the worst. Um, we actually have... What, the WWF came out with its quarterly report today, and they made 11 point seven million dollars this last quarter, which is lower than usual, but you know, a lot of that's due to the XFL. They spent fourteen million dollars on startup costs for the XFL, um, which was a negative, but they also got a seven million dollar payment from NBC for the XFL. Well that's half of it. Yeah, that's half of it anyway. That's half the losses. Okay. So that actually makes sense. I was thinking something different. Um, so anyway they had eleven million um, so yeah so they're their share of XFL losses was like seven million. So right now the XFL is uh, twenty-two million in the hole uh, before. But you know, I mean, that was not that unexpected. Yeah. They had a bunch of Linda McMahon did a big. Um, uh, she did a, a conference this morning, and there was also let me see what we got here. Some details on some stuff. You know, um, I mentioned something about the uh, the the XFL ratings in just a second. I got the the, the ratings of the XFL from NBC. You know what? What's actually scary is, you know, one of the reasons that the number, you know, how the number went up um, after primetime ended. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. You know why? Because there was this giant jump at 11:30 from a 5-1 to a 6-6. You know what that was for? They were waiting for Saturday Night Live. Everyone tuning in to see Jennifer Lopez. So I mean, you take. I mean, it's like they need to get on the field next week. I know. I know. But. You know, so realistically, um, if anything, they're, and the demos, you know, in their target audience, you know, that male 12 to 17, male 12 to 24, man, those last 15 minutes of that football game, through the roof. <laughs> that is amazing. I mean, so the actual, the actual numbers are, are even worse than, <laughs> even worse than I wrote for the actual, for the actual game itself. I mean, it isn't because, you know, that was the game and that was what people were watching. But I mean, they had this giant tune-up, tune-in factor of you know males 12 to 24 in the last 15 minutes. So uh, anyway, I didn't I didn't realize when I got all the quarters and all the breakdowns, and it's like wow, wow, it's like that, that rating isn't for football, that's for Jennifer Lopez. Anyway, uh, what else did we get here? From I WWF? assume that will not be mentioned by the WWF. I don't even think they know. Okay. You know, you got to look at this close to, to decipher this kind of stuff. I mean, when it see it when it happens. At a certain minute, and there's this giant jump, you got to go, okay, now what happened in this minute? And I'm thinking, 11.30, what happened in this minute? And it was like, Saturday Night Live was supposed to start. It was promoted all week. Jennifer Lopez is on it. And that's why everyone tuned in. And uh, they waited for 45 minutes, or half an hour. Yeah, 45 minutes before that show started, which is another story in and of itself. Um, Can you change uh, Saturday Night Live to the lead-in for the XFL? Uh, yeah, but then it'd have to start at 7.30. Or seven or six thirty or something. They wouldn't go for that. that. Defeats the whole purpose. Maybe they could put the XFL on at eleven thirty and Saturday Night Live on at eight. The um, but the whole idea of, of Saturday Night Live is you know kids go out and then they come home to watch it. Later How about night. XFL at one in the morning? I'll do a good share. <laughs> Nobody's gonna watch it though. <laughs> <laughs> the um, let's see. Um, the company. This is from WWF uh, quarterly statement. Uh, as compared with this period a year ago, and this is for the months of um, was it November, December, and January, they were up 12% in pay per view, which is sort of misleading. Okay, the um, let's see those three months. So it's wait, it was November, December, January, or December? Uh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, November, December, January. I gotta look. Okay, because Royal Rumble was down, and uh, the Survivor Series was down. The December pay per view Armageddon was up, but. They increased a lot in international pay-per-view sales, plus the Fanatic series, plus they had that British pay-per-view. So overall, they end up with more buys. It's sort of it's, it's sort of misleading. Um, the uh, they increased in television revenue. A lot of that was because they had that you know the, the Viacom deal pays a whole lot more than the USA Network deal. Uh, advertising was about the same, uh, which is good because ratings are down and the advertising stays stagnant. So that's good. And plus, we're in a soft advertising market. 
uh, let me see, the merchandise was about the same as last year uh, at this time. What was up was uh, income from WWF New York, which, of course, this, at this time last year, they weren't promoting nearly as well as they are now, and an increase in revenue from publishing, which is, of course, the successful books that they've got that are out there. They were offset by lower licensing revenue, lower home video level, and lower Internet advertising revenue, even though their Internet... Uh. Well, that's because that market's just falling apart. I know. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's not their, you know, their actual Internet uh, stuff is, um, it's what, their, their Internet stuff is still way up there. It's, um, where do I have the numbers here? Uh, every month they average 3.6 million um, unique viewers, which is 120,000 a day, and 244 million page viewers. So their, their increase, uh, from this point last year, they're up 16% on Internet, but because the Internet, Advertising is so soft, uh, they you know their their income from it is well down. Which it's going every income every uh, company's that that way. Ticket sales were down. They're okay that, though because they got that shop zone and everything like that, and they can just sell tons of merchandise. Yeah, yeah, but even including that, their merchandise was flat. Really? Yeah, that's 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 including the shop zone. Yeah, merchandise was flat. Hmm. Almost almost the same as last year at this time. Um, the the attendance was down, but. The uh, revenue is pretty much there. They're now averaging thirty-three dollars and thirty-six cents per ticket sale for WF Live events, and that was the main stuff. Let's see, they got fifty-nine thousand three hundred tickets sold for Mania, so they're going to break the all-time record for the building. Uh, SmackDown Two is the number one selling title for PlayStation, and the No Mercy video has sold seven hundred fifty thousand units in two months, and uh, XFL. They are averaging 33,000 uh, attendance per game. They budgeted 20,000, so they're well ahead. Of course, that's oh, season openers for everybody. It's not going to stay up to that level, probably. Um, they say that they've kicked off with 40 million in advertising. They don't mention that they budgeted, uh, I believe, 63 million for advertising. So they're actually below that. Um, ratings. Uh, so they talk about approximately. This is, this is one of those great misleading stats. Approximately 70% of the viewers that watched the first week. Also watch the second week. That's actually totally untrue. <laughs> About. <laughs> but what they did was they added up the uh, audience for the three games the second week and compared them with the audience for the two games the first week. Oh, I see. But even then, it's only even then you know you can't get to seventy percent. You can't. But you can come close. You can get up to about. You can get sixty-eight percent of the households, probably sixty-five, sixty, probably sixty-five percent of the audience. But they'll disappoint with that. The other thing they did was uh, they did um, they interviewed a random study of 1,500 WWF fans. Um, somehow I wonder it's if it's probably on WWFparents.com. Yeah, this this some of this stuff you know I mean the whole thing that Brian was talking about yesterday about it, like uh, the wrestling fans really make less money than other people and they did they, anyway in their own survey that they did they found out that in fact. Wrestling fans average 16% higher income than the national average. That 62% of their uh, of their fans that are adults categorize their occupations as professional or white collar. 30% have attained four-year college degrees, which is above the national average. Uh, then this, listen to this stat, okay? And then when it, you know everything's fine. I'm reading this all. Well, you know, could be true, right? And maybe, and, and and I'm not saying it's not. But this one, when this stat came in. It was like, okay, this whole survey's got to be thrown out. 77% watch all three major shows, SmackDown, Raw, and Heat. Okay. Now, if that's, that's the case... That's impossible. It's absolute, that's right. It's absolutely impossible. Because Raw... I mean, Heat's averaging a 2-1. Raw's averaging about a 5. SmackDown's averaging about, you know, 4-6 right now. So he would have Maybe to have gotten 77% of the, five, of the lower the lo rating. Of, of, uh, the, the, of um... No, 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 no. 77% would have to watch. So the highest rated show, which is Raw, that would mean that SmackDown would have to average about a 3... I mean, no, not SmackDown, but um, Heat would have to do a 3-9 for that to be statistically possible. Yeah. And that would be mean that nobody watches Heat that also doesn't watch Raw in the whole country. For And, and Heat would have to average 3 -9. So that is so bogus. Anyway, and then, then this is probably something that we'll be hearing a lot about. 83% of parents with kids between the age of 2 and 11 and 70% of parents of teenagers discuss characters' content and context of WF programming with their children. Which, what does way, that mean? I don't and know. And the parent it, goes, don't watch that. 
<laughs> is that a discussion? No, because, no they say that 93% of parents with children watch wrestling with their children. And I don't buy that for a second. That's almost impossible. 93% of parents with kids watch wrestling with their kids. That would mean that... Then how do they only average 1.6 people per household watching Raw? It's, it's, it's impossible. Some of these stats seem a little bit skewed. Uh, I would say so. I'm going to mention some more news. Let's see, Sue Hart was, received the Order of Canada, which is... Um, what is that exactly? I mean, I know it, it's like it means like you know, you're you did really good in your life, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I don't know, like it's kind of like knighthood in England, isn't it? Sure. I'm not saying maybe it's not. That's probably not it. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. I just know that he got it. So anyway, that was good. Uh, now this isn't good, and we have many complaints about this already. Uh, this poll result. If the major world champions were put against each other under shoot fighting rules in a tournament, who do you think would end up victorious? 35% said Kurt Angle. Okay, 19% said Scott Steiner. 7% said Kensuke Saki. 23% said Mark Coleman. And 16% said whoever was luckiest on that given day. And anyway, um, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, there are people who think that that showed... Um, a lack of intelligence among the listeners of this show, and it probably, to an extent, did. I hate to say that. Um, I'll go through this really quick. Um, whoever was luckiest on that given day is a decent response because luck in, is involved. But for Mark Coleman to finish behind, even though Kurt Angle, if Mark Coleman was not in it, is probably a very valid choice because he was an Olympic gold medalist. Um, I mean, in a shoot fight, I would certainly greatly favor... Uh, Mark Coleman over Kurt Angle. I think anyone would just because uh, Kurt Angle's never trained in it and Mark Coleman has. So that gives him a huge advantage. Even though as wrestlers, Kurt Angle was a more successful wrestler than Mark Coleman just as, pure, as a pure amateur wrestler. Um, the bottom line is is that Mark Coleman would be a good enough wrestler theoretically to avoid Kurt Angle's takedown. And even if Kurt Angle got on top... What's he going to uh, do? Yeah, what's he going to do? He doesn't. He's never trained in submissions. He's never trained in striking. Um, now, the one thing that Kurt Angle might have over Mark Coleman is, is that Olympic Mark Coleman... Slam. No, Mark Coleman could get tired in a long match, which he often does, and Kurt could... So, again, Kurt Angle is not a, an embarrassing choice. Now, Scott Steiner, finishing with 19% and Mark Coleman with 23%. I think that's what people were mad at. But anyway, I'll go... probably have a couple of notes on that later. Uh, any other news to get to before we... Uh, well, actually, I should talk about today's poll, which is... Involving ECW. Let me get that question out here. Um, what do you think about ECW's future on pay-per-view? A, one last show will be held on March 11th. B, there will be one last show, but it won't be taking place on March 11th. C, they're going to run many more shows. And D, they will never run another pay-per-view again. So, any, any other news before we start getting emails? No. Nah. None? Okay. Start hitting emails. Uh, Dave, why don't you stay home and watch Thunder last night? I'm questioning your loyalty to wrestling. Uh, I, I work like 100 hours a week on wrestling. Unfortunately, it was Valentine's Day. So that's why I didn't. I, I could have, but I would have had another breakup. Uh, let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Do you want to have gone for watching Thunder together? <laughs> I don't even think she'd go for watching SmackDown together. Okay. <laughs> let alone Thunder. Thunder's a tough one. I can't get anyone to watch that one in this house. Uh, let's see. I'm surprised no one's brought this up yet. On Raw, when Justin Credible ran in, JR was saying it's ECW's Justin Credible, which sounds like they still want to consider him an ECW guy if they have if they have another pay-per-view. But then at the end of the segment, Jerry Lawler very clearly said, is ECW even around anymore? I know his gimmick is to be anti-ECW, but I don't think he'd say something like that if there wasn't something they were building towards. What do you think? Reading too much into a comment. I think that those comments were very carefully said. I don't think that they were at random, so you're probably not reading too much in it, but I'm not sure exactly... I'm not sure exactly what those comments mean, other than I think they were meant to mean something. Uh, let's see. While premiering the ECW guys, would Vince be better served to wait until they're in New York or Philadelphia area? The reason is these guys will get a huge pop from the ECW heavy crowd, and then JR can explain the reason that people know who these guys are. It may start them at a higher level if that's what Vince wants to do, especially the guys who are saying that they don't have the charisma to get over in Vince's world. Yeah, well, I mean, they brought in Justin Credible at uh, Meadowlands, so um, when Taz first came in, didn't, didn't wasn't Taz's first UCW match in uh, Philly? It was in New York. They were in New York and Philly. That, match? 
That means first WWF when he came in, remember? It was at Rumble. And that was Madison Square Garden, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think the next night was Philadelphia, which was Raw. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I think that, you know, they're not going to like... And guys, I mean, look, like, look where it got that guy. And he got a great pop. Yeah. But yeah. that's nothing in the long run. In the long run, it probably doesn't mean anything. But I think that they, they do, and I know with Taz they did, and I would think with Just Incredible they did. I think that the idea is if they're near New York and Philadelphia, they would be more apt to debut an ECW guy there feeling that the crowd would react better than, say, in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I th you know, but if they need to, you know, they're going to do what they need to do. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something. I know as a fact it's something taken into consideration because with Taz, I mean, that absolutely was. You know, I mean, it was like they expected him to get a big pop. Not as big as he got, obviously. But they expected more recognition because they were in New York and Philly that weekend. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain the logic in all Japan keeping the Triple Crown on Tenru. Now that Sasaki and Kawada has occurred, Kawada should annihilate Tenru and get the title. However, at the end of the next tour, Tayo K gets the title shot. What are they thinking? Kawada is the only talent in the entire company. Um, as far as, like, I think everyone knows um, why Tenru got it instead of Kawada. You know, when you look into the future, what happened. Um, as, obviously, Kawada is going to end up with it. I think that the idea is that the Tenru and Kawada is a big show and they need to save it for Budokan Hall. Um, and this, the next title match, they're using at Yokohama Bunka Gym, which is a much smaller place. And I think the feeling is, is why waste Tenru and Kawada in a 4,900-seat building when you've been very next month, or not even the next month, because actually they'll do Champion Carnival. So the Carnival Final will be there. But, but it gives them, when they go into Budokan, say in June, or whenever that next Budokan date after the Carnival Final is, they've got a ready-made main event if they need it in Tenru and Kawada, rather than wasting it on you know, Yokohama Bunga Gym. So that's that's the reason. Plus, the longer they wait to put the belt on Kawada, it probably will mean more when he gets it. Uh, let's see. From the XFL home office in Marmora, New Jersey. That's not where their home office is. from Frank Jewett. Ten ways the XFL will keep the games from going over time. Player introductions will be limited to yelling, What's up? Opening scramble replaced by a jump ball. That's pretty good. Play continues during commercial breaks, but the offensive team always takes the knee so that the home viewers know they'll never miss anything important. Uh, yeah, XFL timekeeper is replaced by the Royal Rumble timekeeper. <laughs> uh, game no longer stops to treat injured players. Instead, they have of giving a five-yard halo rule uh, while they ca crawl people off the field. The fourth quarter has changed from 15 minutes to TV time limit remaining. Uh can you top this overtime is played simultaneously at opposite ends of the field at the same time. The video tape machines are rolling. We'll show you who won at the beginning of next week's show. <laughs> that's a good one. With five minutes to go, Pat gives the wheel a final spin. Oh, wait, that's Wheel of Fortune. That's how they keep that one from going over. And number one, XFL referees were replaced by Dave Hebner. It's Earl Hebner. Ring the bell. Ring the bell. Uh, this is from Mike Olis. Uh, I was trying to be a smart ass here going, I would like to ask out of curiosity how you figure out the demographics for TV shows. Do you guess? Yes, I make them all up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you use a magic calculator? Ah, magic calculator. That's, that's a good one, too. Can you see through the television? Uh, yes, I have x-ray vision. I see through the television. But actually, I get it from Nielsen. And all the companies get it. And all the companies get the same numbers. And... Uh, I just like look at him real close. Probably closer than the companies. I hope that guy was being a smart ass and that wasn't a real question. Yeah. Uh, Eddie looked horrible on Raw. He had little or no tan. He looked like he gained 20 pounds. Trying and to have a tough enough. What? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know that they're recruiting ringers for tough enough. Oh, we yeah. talked about that. Right? Yeah. Uh, what's up with X-Pac? Uh, why don't they give him new music and a new gimmick? That suck it thing is long gone. I thought he was going to come back with like a whole new makeover. I think with Justin, I don't know. I, I thought so, too, actually. Uh, who is it that's getting a new makeover? Uh, Vampiro, right? They won. Well, they won. <laughs> yeah, ain't going to happen. Uh, at least he ain't going to be back anytime soon anyway. This is from Mike. I noticed WF wrestlers have stopped using pile drivers. Undertaker and Kane both stopped doing the tombstone. Rikishi stopped doing the sit-down pile driver. Did WF institute a ban on pile drivers, or are they, were they just not getting over? Uh, pretty much they instituted a ban, although on, on rare occasions... China. You, you can, you can do them. Like uh, if if there's a specific reason why they need to be done, you can do them. But generally speaking, they have strongly discouraged all their wrestlers from doing any moves where they drop someone on their head. I think it's partially the Drozdov thing, partially so when if a kid gets hurt dropping someone on the other one's head, the WWF can say, hey, you know, we don't even let our wrestlers do it. Mm -hmm. You know, 
they didn't make a big deal out of it, but it's been for several months. They don't want people suplexing each other on their heads. Um, yeah, basically no dropping someone on their head. At one point, they were even they were even talking about not letting the wrestlers do DDTs, but then the wrestlers explained that DDTs are very safe and relatively easy bump. Because the move that actually scared everyone was, um, God, what was it? It was almost, almost a year ago now. The Dean Malenko Scotty Too Hotty DDT off the ropes. After that one, which that was an incredible scary, looking no. fit. After that was an incredible looking finisher of an inc of a really great match, the feeling was is that oh, yeah, someone's someone's going to try to top that and get hurt, and uh, WWE's playing it safe, which a lot of people don't like. But you know what? It's for the it probably should. It, it's it, well, it's for the better. Um, you know, yeah, I, it's you know a lot. You know, I mean that's why they didn't publicize it was because people won't accept it for the better. But it probably is. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Eric said that you have to use old talent to get over new talent. Were the rumors of Landstorm pushed towards a world title? Where are those rumors coming from? You know, Landstorm where they're coming from? The world title. You. <laughs> from me? Yeah, really. Why? What did I say? I don't know, but I was on the uh, Landstorm website the other day, and he had a uh, he had like this message board, and there were a bunch of people that sent him this message, talk about how he's going to get this big push, and it was attributed to you, and I thought. I never said anything like that. I, I well, never. I got credit for it. Yeah. Okay. And we did uh, credit you with saying like he was a horrible worker that would uh, never get anywhere in his business. <laughs> uh, I didn't say that. I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> um, see, would Eric consider contacting Bret Hart to be his manager? I, I cannot imagine Bret Hart coming in as Lance Storm's manager. I mean, he may call him, but I, I just, especially right now, I don't see that happening. I mean, you know, you can never predict like two, three years from now what someone's going to do, but. But right now, I, I just don't see it at all. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. Uh, I think mainstream sports have lost the attention of teenagers for two reasons. The first one is the players are making too much money. The Yankees have won four out of five World Series because they have more money, or at least willing to spend more money than any other team. This makes the game boring and too predictable. Another reason is this. When you go to a sporting event and spend $100 for front row seats, you want to meet uh, some of your favorite players and maybe get some autographs. Well, nowadays, the big sports stars will not sign for you. You see, most of the big stars have exclusive contracts with major trading card companies uh, and are only allowed to sign for them at their autograph shows. The players don't realize that if we didn't pay $100 for front row seats, they wouldn't be paid as well as they are. The fans are the ones that make these guys stars, and they're not even willing to sign or, in some cases, even talk to the fans. These are the two biggest reasons why there's no connection between the fans and the, uh, the, between the, the new generation of fans and the new generation of players. I don't know. Uh, while watching a few old Royal Rumbles, a couple of questions came to mind. How did Tuesday in Texas come about? Was it always planned? It was just... We've talked about this one many times. It was just an idea... Why is that, by the way? What? People are just so interested in this whole Tuesday from Texas thing. Well, because they never did it again. And it, and it seemed like it was out of the... You know, it's like... You know, I mean, I guess, like, if you weren't around and didn't realize it had been planned for months, you might think, oh, my God, like, they screwed up a finish on a pay-per-view and had to do another pay-per-view the week later. Although, you know, if they did screw up a finish on a pay-per-view, they could just do it on TV the week later or on Raw the next night today. You know, you don't have to... What it was was Vince McMahon just wanted to see if he shot a really big angle at a pay-per-view, and at that point in time, Hulk Hogan losing the title was about as a big an angle as you could do, and come back a week later figuring the momentum from the first pay-per-view would carry over the second, I don't even think it was a week, was it? I think, wasn't it like two, just two days, the next Tuesday? I think it was like six days. I, I think it was know, a Wednesday. I think it was like the next Tuesday, like two days later. Yeah, but no, no, the pay-per-view no, pay I think was on a Wednesday, though. Or maybe it was on a Thursday, that week before, because it was oh, Thanksgiving right, weekend. That's right, the Survivor Series. It was like the Thanksgiving night tradition. Yeah, I don't know. So I'm sure that I'm sure that many, many people are going to email us and tell us exactly how many days it was, but it was probably five or six days between. Yeah, you're okay. right. Was it, always, was it always planned? Yes, it was. It was just always, yeah, that's how it was planned. Um, let's see. Do you have TNN ratings for the Birmingham New York Hitmen game? Yeah, it was um, 2.4 national number. I mean, what is it? Is it 2.4 cable number, which correlates to like 1.9 national number, I believe. That's from Milton, who goes, I thought Eric Bischoff came off like a million bucks on the show. He said all the right things and even has me believing that maybe they'll turn it around down the line. It'll never happen, but wouldn't it be great if X-Pac and Justin Credible challenged Chris Jericho to a tag team match at No Way Out? Jericho would bring in Jerry Lynn's partner. Too soon, not going to happen. Jerry Lynn has history with both guys, so it makes sense. It's a great way to give Jerry Lynn a face rub, but it'll never happen. Huh, so you already know. Uh, by the way, what was the point of having Eddie Guerrero make that awesome return last week, only to have a three-minute TV match with Chris Jericho seven days later? Uh, I set up a rematch at the pay-per-view. Yeah. Are they going to do a rematch? That, that, you know, I don't even I know what so. the... 
Or maybe they'll do something with Justin Credible and um, X Pac against Jericho and Eddie is like partners who don't get along. Or a four way. Or maybe a three way dance. They could do three way. Jericho, X Pac, and Eddie, three way. Uh -huh. They could do that too. We are here with Rick Bassman from Ultimate Pro Wrestling. Uh, Rick, how you doing today? Good, Dave. How you doing? Doing really good. Uh, I guess first thing, uh, what's uh, what's any any major news coming into a Wednesday show, and what's going on with the school and everything? Uh, show this Wednesday, Galaxy Concert Theater is going to be a live webcast, uh, eight central, or sorry, eight Pacific, eleven Eastern at UPW.com. Uh, just a real, real solid show from from top to bottom. All our guys and girls, uh, six of whom are now signed to uh, WWF, two of whom are signed to WCW. We've got uh, Stevie Richards and Ivory coming in to go on two on two with Frankie the Future, who I think uh, will be picked up soon by a major, and Looney Lane. So it should be an interesting matchup. We've got the uh, continuation of our No Cal So Cal feud, which is something I thought uh, I think people thought they'd never see, which is UPW going head to head with APW. And that's been interesting. So, you know, on, on one hand, it's just a show. On the other, it's a great show from top to bottom. We'll see how it goes. How did that work out, the first show? What's that, the APW-UPW deal? Yeah, and, 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 and how did that all get... And basically, I guess that, you know, Tony Jones, Mike Modest, and Donovan Morgan came down on the December show. Exactly. How, how did that happen? Because I remember, you know, I was at that December show, and we actually on the air brought up that possibility... And I remember Mike and Donovan both said it's a great idea and it'll never happen. And then here it is a month later and it happens. Well, right. Well, the, what the, the history behind that basically is, I, I think as you know, Dave, we have a management company also in which we represent guys and girls signed to the big companies. And Tony Jones has been a friend and a client for some time now. Mike Modest is a friend. And uh, Donovan's become a friend over the past few months. So they've been actually working shows for us for probably going on half a year now. And we've done well drawing for our shows and, and selling them out, as you've seen, by bringing in, you know, name talent. And we thought it'd be cool to take a shot at really building programs from within our own organization to see if we could uh, sell on that basis. And my thoughts were that, um, you know, based on Roland and APW continually bashing us on the, uh, on the web and being that there are enough people out there that read that stuff that are interested in it, Thought it might be cool to uh, to do a little inner promotional feud. So basically, I broached the idea to uh, to Mike and Donovan, who thought it was uh, a good one, and they put me in touch with Roland, and uh, we just took it from there. Do you think and, Roland got over partially because of Beyond the Mat? Because one thing is, is like all the hardcore fans have pretty much seen that. I think. Yeah, there there were two reasons I think he got over. One was because of that. The other is we really I think did a good job ourselves and. Uh, and the APW folks both on building the feud over the internet. And then lastly, for those who don't follow that sort of thing, we actually produce a program now for our shows. It's full color, it's real, real nice. And the big feature story in the program for people walking through the door was a build up on the feud. So basically, even if you hadn't even heard of it till showing up at the Galaxy a couple hours before showtime, you would have a whole backstory by the time the, uh, the match started to appear. And uh, boy, it just, it got tremendous heat. Really mm -hmm. got over good. You get fans coming down from Northern California to watch it? I honestly don't know. Good question. I don't know that though. But I basically, Pat, many, uh, who, who have, is it, is it but, uh, wouldn't be surprised. Is it, is it pretty much um, now a constant that you always pack that place? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it's it's been a long, slow build, and I think thankfully the, our shows have consistently been good, and for the things that haven't been good, our fans have been pretty forgiving. You know, and I think, I think a big test for us was about four months ago when we had uh, Undertaker booked. And if you remember, he went into that uh, gallbladder surgery on a sort of emergency basis, and he couldn't make our show. Um, Midian agreed to step in, which I thought was very cool. And as you all you know, found out later, Triple H stepped in as well. Well, we put up signs all over the front of the building telling the fans that uh, Taker would not be there but that we have a very special surprise, so if you want a refund, you can get it, but we advise sticking around. And Steve Regal's out doing his bit, and Steve was booked, and then uh, Midian came out. And what I noticed, and was very interesting, is the fans were actually really cool with that. You know, they basically, I think, figured, well, that's a special surprise. You know, UPW's been cool, they've been up front with us, so we're going to be cool with them about Midian. And to us, that was a big, a big test that I think we passed. That's and, of course, test. Triple H came out and blew everybody away. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, who are the, uh, real quick, for people who do know and don't know, who are the guys that you have that are working your shows that are under contract to the two companies right now? Uh, WWF is uh, John Cena, also known as Prototype, who's been everywhere in wrestling media, and I think will be, if I dare say, I think will be one of the top five guys in the business within the next couple of years, uh, all a Kurt Angle type, at least that's what we're hoping for. Uh, Nathan Jones and John Heidenreich are, are two newest giants. Uh, John, John, I'm not familiar with Nathan. I, I, I met at that show, or saw at the show. Okay, so you were or were not familiar? Um, well, Nathan Jones, I know, I know from the World's Strongest Man, and I yeah. saw him at the show, six foot ten, yeah. he's a large human being with giant feet. Um, guy. No, no, John, who's John? John Heidenreich is an ex uh, World Football League player who moved out here a few months back from New Orleans, who, to me, is really like our new prototype in a way, just by by the way he sets the standard for for dedication and and work ethic. And the fact that he's six seven, three twenty, and, and ripped, and a hell of an athlete, probably doesn't hurt either. But uh, amazing guy and a good guy. We've had John working a lot uh, theatrically and commercially out here as well. Um, hardcore kid Aaron Aguilera, Bad Boy Basil, uh, Basil Bozinas are also both signed to uh, WWF Developmental, and uh, the twins Diane and Elaine Klimashevsky, who are who are on uh, each show, are signed there. And then uh, as far as WCW signees, and then they're both new, as uh, you know, Chris Daniels, long last, and, uh, and Mike Modest. So it's, uh, it, it's pretty stacked from top to bottom. But um, I, I'd be willing to predict that there's eight to ten other people appearing on that show, the Samoa Joes, the KG Sakotas, Frankie the Futures, that will be a force in the business within the next few years. So it's, it's a pretty amazing, it's an amazing backstage, that's for sure. Now, what's the status of television? I know when I was at the show, you you taped it as if it was a, a like a raw. I mean, that's the interesting thing about these shows is that it's like uh, you know you have the, it's it, most independents that you go to. Um, you know, I mean, the matches are kind of you know laid out. You know, you go 15 minutes, but if they go 18 or 12, it's not really a big deal. I mean, with your show, basically the guys. I mean, they got the ref, they get the signal to go home. I mean, it's it's run like this is a live. It's run like it's a live television show, basically. And you, you, were, you were taping it, you know, I mean, it was a demo tape, the one that I went to. Well, what's the status of television? Well, unfortunately, we had some, we had some edit problems or, or personnel problems, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty prevalent on this level. And we should have had the darn thing cut over a month ago. Because of those problems, we didn't. As I just was explaining to, uh, to Al, your producer, on the break, I actually jumped out of edit today to, uh, to get on your show. So we're finally finishing up the edit on the pilot. Uh, UPN here locally is waiting to see it, as is KCAL, which is uh, an ABC Disney-owned station. Um, we'll get on TV sometime in the next few weeks, and I know that's a, it's a big statement to make, but we will get on somewhere because the product does look that good. It, if it ends up being cable, well, then it's cable. But we will be on soon, and then the, uh, the goal is just to do some additional local shots behind that, a regular L.A. date, a regular uh, San Bernardino date, and then the same for San Diego. I will send what about, you a copy when it's done. We're almost there. Uh, also, you know, we've had some questions sent in. Um, what about videos of the house shows? A lot of the one that a lot of people are interested in is the Van Dam Daniels match. Yeah, we are, we will once we have this done. Start putting more video out. You know, the, the trick with video is it's fairly easy to produce, although it is time and to a degree cost intensive. When you get people saying, "Oh, I'll put it out because we want to buy it," but the truth is. You really need to have well-established distribution networks, and that's where our focus is right now, is in getting those networks established. So once that's done, we'll start to get this stuff out. In the meantime, as as you know, we have our uh, our training series out, and it's out retail now. Walmart, uh, Camelot, Coconuts, uh, Best Buy, and it's doing pretty well. Uh, we're putting out uh, UPW Vixens, which is our version of uh, of the Divas. And that'll feature Looney Lane and Sadist and Savvy and the Twins and uh, Real Storm and the rest of the girls. And then uh, we do have one show out, which is called Fresh Blood, a live show. So there, there's a fair amount of product on the market already, as well as our uh, Discovery Special, which is due out through uh, Artisan just next month. What about the uh, ideas they had for the concept of doing like the weekly real world type show that uh, WWF is now taking advantage of with Tough Enough? Uh, let me just say we're working on it. Mm-hmm. I'd rather just leave it at that for now. What uh, was your thought? Um, 
I actually got a tape of this. Brian, did you watch the the, the um, blind date thing with Looney Lane? No, I didn't see it. Okay, okay. Well, I, I actually did see it. So, what was your thought of how that all went? You know, unfortunately, I haven't seen it yet. Um, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I was I was involved in it to a degree. Blind date had contacted us some time ago and asked. Uh, for, for someone to put on. They have a couple big UPW fans working at the Blind Date office who we thought Looney would be a natural choice. And I don't know what actually made the final cut because we actually had a show the night that this thing aired, and I have the tape, but I haven't watched it yet. The first segment that they shot, at least, was in one of our two training facilities with uh, Looney show putting uh, some of her moves on her date for the evening. That, um, that made it. It did. That Good. made it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they had, um, I mean, I saw, like, Damien Steele there. Yep. Um, yeah. They showed. Deal. You know, they showed. Like, they showed him in the ring. It was. Um, it was blind date. I mean, it's. <laughs> I don't know. What this is. Suffice I mean, it was. Huh? It was. It was. You know, it was mildly amusing in, in that blind date sort of way, where you know, right. you know, they have this guy going like, you know, what, you know, what is this? These, you know, what I mean. That guy was, was terrified. Jeez, he really was. He, I don't know if that played on television or not. Um, he, I, I wouldn't say ter. I, I can't say he came off as terrified. But he definitely came off as as um, thinking he would rather go on a different date. <laughs> yeah, I think when it was, I think that was the end result was that um, that he would rather have gone out on a different date. That 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 wrestling thing was a little intimidating towards him. Yeah, I, I think it was. You know, we, we we try to make the guy comfortable, but you know, what will be will be. It's just, it's something we were not expecting any uh, Emmy caliber television out of that. But we thought it'd be well. fun, and <laughs> Looney wanted to do it, so it just seemed like a cool thing to do, and certainly no regrets about it. Blind Date has called again, and uh, we've declined to put somebody else on because I don't really see the reason to do that again. Well, she's the best one to put on rather than some of those other women. I mean, because she's. The other one, I don't know, then again, it's Blind Date, I shouldn't have said that. Because, I mean, the one thing that she has going for her is that she's kind of, um, uh, you know, normal pretty girl look. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than that kind of, um, Real you know, there. overly, you know, like some of, like, like uh, what's the girl's name? Um, God, I forget her name. The one that was Mandy. It's in the, delicious, in the, Frosty. Yeah, Frosty Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah where Frosty, it's like. Frosty looks like a, like a Playboy Playmate, sure. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, I mean, we, we've got all kinds of different girls, as you know. I mean, there were three others, I think, that would have been equally as good. One is Savvy, who I think is very attractive and in a very, you know, everyday sort of way. Uh, Nurse Cassie, who's, who's hysterical. And, uh, and who am I missing here? I don't know. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think we would have been in good shape with any of a number, but Jenny's a good personality for that kind of thing. Uh, this is someone who's asking this from John, who's asking, um, about your background in UPW and wrestling before UPW, and also, uh, what did you do with your life between uh, 1985 when you discovered Sting and Warrior, which actually a lot of people don't know about. We should probably talk about that real quick. We've talked about it on the show before, and the formation of UPW. You, you were in a, you've been in a lot of different things. Yeah, a lot. You know, just basically the the entertainment slash sports business entrepreneur thing. Um, I was a, a theatrical agent at a company called Triad, which later became William Morris, or I should say was bought by William Morris, and it took care of people there like uh, like Ed Harris and Alexander Gudinov and, and Sherilyn Fenn. Uh, went on from there to be a sports agent in Denver for a lot of players on the Broncos and the uh, and the uh, Nuggets professional sports teams before they had uh, baseball and hockey many years later. Ended up uh, at Disney for a time as an executive marketing and TV production executive over at a property called Pleasure Island. Actually brought uh, wrestling to Disney at that time before WCW ever showed up there. And also have uh, produced and uh, distributed a bunch of uh, pay-per-view specials, all sorts of different weird things. So really a lot of different things, a lot entrepreneurial, a lot uh, a lot just jobs. Uh, what, whatever, you know, this is kind of off the subject, but whatever happened to chemo? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, the, the, the funny thing is we're we're editing our, our pilot today, as I mentioned, and we're doing it at a place called Panther Productions, which is a... Uh, they do all the martial arts videos, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Joe yeah. Jennings, who, who owns Panther, is a good friend and a mentor of sorts, and he had told me that he heard uh, Kimo had been incarcerated for some time. Now, <laughs> I, I hope your transcript, uh, when these come, come out, reflects that. I'm just passing on what I heard. I don't know that to be true. But um, other than that, that's that's the first time I've actually heard his name in probably six months. Yeah, because because you were instrumental in getting him that New Japan deal, weren't you? And then he he did maybe one or two shows, and then he just disappeared. I didn't have too much to do with that. Actually, um, 
some friends were really more involved in, in getting chemo into that deal. And I'm not trying to divest myself of the responsibility. The fact is, I just I just did not do that deal, to be honest. Okay. Now, oddly enough, I ran into and uh, spent some time with Anoki over the weekend, though. At Cauliflower fun. Alley? or at Cauliflower Alley. How was Cauliflower Alley? We haven't talked about that one at all. That thing is a trip, man. Have you been to those? I used to go every year um, in the in the 80s, and I probably, I don't know if I've gone, there was one year where it was really boring, I don't know, probably like 93-ish, and yeah. I was just sort of like, I never yeah. got around to going again, but then people told me, because they used to have it at that, oh, what's it, Studio City, at that, at um, the Sportsman's, Sportsman's Lodge, Lodge. Yeah, way every back year. When, way back when. Yeah, well, well that's when I would. That, it's in Vegas now, and that makes it yeah. fun. But uh, we had a great time. I mean, I really enjoyed going there. A lot of interesting characters there. Ran into a lot of people I hadn't seen for years, so that was fun. Um, I, I was curious going there, especially with a pretty large contingent as we did, how we'd be received, being that we're often looked at as, you know, a real new, maybe cutting-edge type of company. And as we all know, Cauliflower Alley is, is sort of like the old guard. But um, they were great. I mean, the reception was great. They uh, recognized us from the podium as, as developing the talent of tomorrow. That was fun. We still with you, Dave? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I lost yeah. you for a second there. I thought I no, lost no, my no, connection, no. sorry. Um, how, did, how were Heenan and Mike today? Um, funny at times, real funny at times, overly rehearsed uh, at others. But uh, mm -hmm. one gag that I remember that I thought was just hysterical is today was wearing a black tuxedo and Heenan was wearing a white tuxedo. And at one point, uh, Heenan turned to Tanae over the microphone and said, Hey, I'll bet you we look like Pat Patterson's wedding cake. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which has been all over the website since. Oh, but my God. That was oh just, my God. It, it was funny. And I, and I thought Pat was supposed to be there, but I didn't see him. And I think they intended on saying that with him being there. But he wasn't there. <laughs> uh, let me see. Just a couple of things here. Uh, I wanted to get through before we get back hey, Rick, to Rick. Do you have any uh, political problems as far as like having guys under WWF and WCW contract working the same show? You know, I, I haven't. And that's a very, very valid question. You know, we are, we're essentially a development territory for WWF, mm -hmm. and I think we've been very good for them, and I know in return they've been amazingly good to us. Um, but we've also been fortunate enough to, uh, to get some guys hooked up, uh, with Atlanta as well, without, at least as far as I know, without any, uh, feathers being ruffled. You know, our, our thing is this. We're, we're trying to do two things out here. We're trying, one, to turn UPW into a real entity that can actually, you know, be, be in, quote, unquote, a real company that puts people on salary, you know, keeps them busy, myself included. Um, on the other side, we're looking at uh, developing talent and in, in working them in the business so they can make a living. And we get to know these people from day one. I mean, we start them, we train them. For the most part, there are exceptions, you know, the Chris Daniels and whatnot. But... Um, We'll train them from day one, and by the time they're ready to go somewhere, they're, they're friends of ours. And if, if WWF is not interested for whatever reason, I feel somewhat obligated to try to get behind them and help them move along. And uh, WWF has always been super, super cool about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, it, it could happen, but it hasn't, at least as far as I know. There hasn't been any problems. I mean, WWF would have first option. Like, like you know, it's not like, just as an example, like Daniels, it's not like WWF didn't have a chance to sign him. I mean, for years, literally. So you're, you're, before... you're positively right. WWF definitely has first shot through us. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, in Chris's case, and, and I, I want to put a big congratulations out to Chris, because as you know, he was signed once before to WCW. He signed again. I think the intent is to use him now, so I really think we're going to see him move up fast. But, um, yeah, WWF had looked at Chris. They know him well. He has a lot of friends there. Um, they like him. But uh, the time just wasn't right for him to be there. So hopefully the time is uh, perfect for him at WCW. We'll see Any how it problems turns as far out. as, like, uh, you know, WWF guys doing jobs for WCW guys? You mean on, on our shows? Yeah. Oh, we've never done that. Okay. No, I don't, you know, let's, let's see. Let's think about this. I can't think of a time we've ever had... I mean, you could theoretically... Put like Daniels against Cena, theoretically, like if you did it like on next month's show in a single, right? I mean, it could theoretically, but you know what? I, where I think it wouldn't is that in the case of if, if it was like a guy who was on WWF, like like if WWF was sending you someone, like say Regal, 
Well, we've got and you Stevie put him against Daniels. Right, right. Yeah, or, 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 some, or yeah, Stevie Richards. And then you ask Stevie Richards to do a job for Daniels, who's your champion, because he's under contract with WCW. Probably that's where the politics would get involved. Mm -hmm. And maybe it wouldn't, because they would. Maybe they would, because realistically, it doesn't, that doesn't matter either. I, I, have, I have two answers but it might. to that. Here, here, here's how I would answer that. First of all, I don't know if there'd be a problem if it were a guy like Chris or Protosite since they came up through us, and at this point at least are probably still perceived mainly as UPW guys. But the second and, uh, and final answer to that question is because we put so much thought and so much time into our booking in the first place, we just wouldn't book a match with one guy from one company and one guy from the other. Well, why, so why, why ask for problems that you don't need or have? Yeah. Uh, this is from John Stevenson, which is, has to do with what we're talking about with Stu Hart. The Order of Canada is our country's highest honor for lifetime achievement. It would be comparable to the U.S. Congress Medal of Honor. So that's what, that's technically what it, what it is. Uh, this is from Steve Queen, who says, In last week's Observer, you mentioned that Kayantai was announced as having a combined weight of 270 pounds and remarked that while they're small, they're not that small. But that is a legitimate number. They just weighed them on the same scale they used to weigh the big show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, do you think that WWF brought ECW talent in because they really want to use them or to prevent WCW from getting them first, uh, which could be used to keep turning the company around? If so, uh, these guys will probably not be used effectively and will be out of the company shortly after WCW collapses. Um, I think there's a little bit of... I mean, there's no question that they, they signed some of the guys. I mean, no question, like Justin Credible, Rhino... Those guys were signed when they were signed because they didn't want WCW to have a chance to sign them. Because the original plan was, you know, only a couple weeks ago, was that they were not going to take any of Paul's guys until Paul either sank or made a deal. And theoretically, Paul's still in the middle of that, and they're signing those guys, and the idea was that they figured those guys, they didn't want to give WCW a chance to get those guys. With um, To Jerry was another one, Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn had a chance to go to WCW. They were not that high on Jerry Lynn, but WCW didn't even make him as good an offer as, as WWF did, so that's why he went there. And then Crazy, obviously they were not that high on Crazy, although they will, you know, it's not like they're not interested, but nobody's interested in Crazy right now at a big dollar figure, so that's the situation. I don't know so much, in fact, I don't think it is at all a concern that those guys would have gone to WCW and turned the whole ship around. Not, I don't think they were afraid they were going to turn the ship around, but I think that the idea was, in the case of Rhino and Just Incredible, these are young talents, they're, they're good, and we have a chance to get him. We like him, mm -hmm. and um, and you know it's a jury too. And it was, it was great. And um, you know why let the opposition have? Why sit back and let the opposition have him? Yeah. You know, kind of like you know. I mean, there, you know that thing happened in uh, whatever it was, ninety five, ninety six, when WCW did like scour the world of the Jerichos and Dean Malenko, Chris Benoit, and all those guys. While WWF, you know, Mysterio. While WWF just had that attitude that you know either they're too small or just they weren't looking to add people like that. And WCW used them to really, you know, have a, a couple of years of great pay-per-views, great pay-per-view undercards especially. And I think that the idea was, hey, someone's that good, you know, you know, let's we'll go after him. Let's head to the calls. Let's start with Chris. Chris, what's going on? Uh, hi, how's it going? It's going good. Uh, I just had one quick question about uh, Karen Mower. Uh, that she was supposed to, was she supposed to be the fitness girl with uh, Stephanie McMahon Helmsley a while ago? Yeah, yeah that, she was that, for a brief period. That was role for a very short period of time, yeah. Do they have any plans to do anything with her? Because I remember reading about her being uh, the stunt woman, and they were supposedly high on her. But, uh... Yeah, Karin, unfortunately, was released by WWF a few months back. So she's out here in L.A. doing her stunt thing still. She's working uh, She's working a ton. And she um, actually she, she just won the, fe the uh, special female Battle Dome Challenge. <laughs> she's a real tough girl. Um <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll, Zoom in, in Battle Dome on uh, the 25th, right? I'm sorry? Zoom in Battle Dome, not this weekend, but next weekend, I heard. Uh, you mean, is it airing then? Is that what you're asking? That's what I heard. Yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I could be I'm wrong. not even sure. The, the actual taping concluded about a month ago. I heard that, that she's going to be on a Battle Dome show next weekend. Yeah, that could be coming. the air date, sure. Yeah. She did win the whole thing. So Carla's just out here working. She's not in the wrestling business right now. But um, we are talking about doing something with the uh, women's promotion that's based out here. Just a couple of special shots. Wow. Oh, 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 for a wow? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it'd be fun. With are you talking with anyone else about going to, doing stuff with wow? Yeah, we're, what, what we're talking about and trying to get to happen is, one, you know, a basic interpromotional angle, bringing a few of our girls in as a group, mm -hmm. which I think would be fun. So we'll just, uh, either it will happen or it won't. We'll know soon. 
Okay, and uh, that's really all I had. I just wanted to say hi to everybody in the uh, Wrestling Observer chat room, and uh, they're waiting for you over there, Brian. Can they keep uh, anticipating you coming in? And, uh, I will be there for it. Kind of an interesting bunch of guys in there, too. So uh, that's really all I have. I just want to say hi to them because they've been hounding me about giving them a plug. So uh, You got the plug in. Yeah, I got the plug, and that's what they wanted me to do. That's all they've been talking about. So, okay. Uh, take care. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a bunch, Chris. Let's go to Mike. Mike, what's up? Hey, uh, Dave? Yes. Uh, this is Michael uh, from Vista. I I won't I won't plug the board, but I was the one who sent you an email uh, that told you I posted up that uh, Eric Bischoff was going to be on that day on your right after he bought they bought WCW. Uh huh. Yeah. You remember? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, Rick. Yep. The, um. I you've already answered one of my questions. I um. I'm waiting for uh, somebody to come down to San Diego. You know. Do you know how soon it's going to be? For somebody to come down to San Diego. Uh, you know, right, right, shows in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know what? It's just going to really be based on when we start television in that market. Mm -hmm. We're doing San Diego on a monthly basis at a uh, club on the beach that are called Canes. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. Well, we, we got a couple uh, promotions like out of Vista, but I never see anything. I grew up in Houston and uh, grew up watching the Paul Bosch promotions so we had wrestling every friday night and i kind of miss it <laughs> sure well we we'll be out there again once television starts in the meantime you've got a very very small promotion running out there mm -hmm. uh ccw is their uh, is their name but not that's about it that's there right now we'll be back once tv starts and we'll be looking for a uh, a nice venue out there like we have with the galaxy so okay. in there well, i've, got, I've got your website up right now um so i'm gonna send roger an email on that street team and all that? Yeah, please do. Yeah, by the way, anyone that's uh, listening out there, we're definitely looking for people to help us out in, in a number of uh, different categories. So definitely uh, send those emails along. Okay. Appreciate it, man. All right, thanks. Thank you. Um, I mean, has, has there been any thought given as far as sending some of your guys like John Cena or any, or any guys, Frankie Kazarian or whatever, up to uh, work for Roland and kind of doing the reverse of that feud? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of thought given to that. And uh, you just might see it sooner than you think. Oh, so there, okay. so there's another cryptic answer for you. Second yeah, one of the cryptic answer. They got a sh they got a show on the 17th. I wonder they, what that means. They do of this month. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. In uh, Matt, b b Visalia, maybe. That'd be this oh, not Visalia. No, no, no. Vallejo, Vallejo. I don't want to make a mistake, but it's a big mistake. And that'd be this. Yeah, they're, they're they're in Vallejo on Saturday. Yeah, I think. Wow. Cool. I think so. I think so. Very cool. Yeah. We'll see. Um, All right. Um, Maybe we'll no, have, no, have to drive up there and just slap rolling around a little bit. We'll see. <laughs> Real quick before we head to a break, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but you were very instrumental in Jim Helwig and Steve Borden, Ultimate Warrior and Sting, getting started in wrestling in the early 80s, uh, kind of looking for guys at the gym. Can you tell everyone a little bit about their background when you first met them and, 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 and why they made it? And there were probably four or five other guys that started with them that kind of didn't make it, really. Yeah, the quick upshot on that, it was a concept group I started back in 1985 called Power Team USA, and this is when I knew really very little about pro wrestling. The idea was to put like four all-American hero types together and try to introduce them into wrestling as a unit to combat the uh, the Sheiks and the Volkovs. Again, having no understanding how, how guys came up through the ranks. Basically went out and cast it with guys of different ethnic mixes who looked real good, you know, could talk, um, had some athletic ability, so on and so forth. And Jim Helwig and Steve Borden were the um, the replacements, respectively. Oh, really? Yeah, they were the replacements for the Indian and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed surfer guy in the group. Um, Helwig replaced a guy named Ed Brock, who would have been amazing had he gone on. Ed, Ed Brock was a... Is that a name I know from bodybuilding? That name sounds familiar to me. Yeah, you probably do. Okay. Big, giant, amazing-looking guy. who would have been great had he gone on. But Helwig, uh, I brought out from Atlanta to join Power Team. That's before he ever had stepped in a wrestling ring. Steve Borden was uh, right here locally in uh, San Fernando Valley. He was the uh, night manager at a Gold's Gym out there. And basically had to really talk him into wrestling. He didn't want to do it at the time, but uh, we all know what happened with him. And uh, if Steve ever listens to this show and I say hello, we've been in very, very active touch again over the past year. We've become friends again. And uh, glad to say that. Hello, Gavin, talked to you in years. I have no idea what he's up to. 
I don't know who he does. I don't think anybody does. <laughs> himself included, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that goes back uh, a ways. Yeah, so I did start both guys back in uh, 1985. Now, were you in, at all involved with Steve DeSalvo and Dave Sheldon, or were they just trained together with them? Yeah, I, I was involved strictly because they were the other two guys in our six-man training group out in, uh, in Northridge with Red Bastien. And I saw Dave Sheldon call Flower Alley. It took me a minute to recognize him and, and vice versa. But uh, very cool running into him again. Yeah, I haven't heard his. I haven't seen him in in a long, long time. I don't. I don't even know what happened to him. Or we had a question about Steve DeSalvo not too long ago. And I don't know what happened to Steve DeSalvo. DeSalvo, DeSalvo also wrestled. DeSalvo, I've got no idea. Um, Dave Sheldon is out uh, in Los Angeles doing the Hollywood thing, you know, movie, TV, commercial sort of thing. Uh, he looked real good. It was nice to see him. And uh, you know, it's funny. Last time I saw Dave in '85, I actually shot on him and airplane spinned him, which is still today my my. Uh, body weight airplane spin record, but he looks so damn big. I didn't want to try to call. Will Roland. <laughs> <laughs> Roll, Roland on the twenty first. Hey, there you go. Kaboom! <laughs> You'll break the record. <laughs> right on, man. That's a good idea. Thank you. I uh, got a couple of email questions, and uh, let me get to uh, one. This one's for Rick. Uh, Rick, who is the best? Who would you say is the best unsigned talent in your company? And who would you say is the most improved wrestler over the last three to six months in your company? Uh, we have so many. Here's a political answer. We have so many great guys. The best one, though, bar none, is Mikey Henderson. And Mikey, yeah, I would have to say that too, for sure. Now that I think about it, yeah. Yeah, and 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 with all due respect to anybody else out there, I think Mikey is. I really believe he's the single best unsigned prospect in the country, as far as being the total package. If uh, and no, no references to Lex Luger intended. Um, they're asked about the best wrestler. I mean, his wrestling ability. Is awesome. It's it's not necessarily at the level of Chris Daniels, but it, it's pretty close. But when you add in things like Mikey's presence, his look, um, the way he carries himself, in my opinion, both companies are missing the boat in a major way and not having Mikey on television right now. So he's number one. Um, most improved, uh, Ryan Sakota wrestles for us under the name Keiji Sakota. You remember him, Dave, from when you were out here? Oh, yeah, 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 from the show, of course. Yeah, Japanese guy, great look, really, really improved his body, coming a long way in his ability. Uh, Samoa Joe, who's only been wrestling for a year and two months now, has been looking fantastic. Uh, big John Heidenreich, the guy who recently signed to uh, WWF, is another. And then uh, lately, and I'm real happy to say it, it looks like uh, Smelly had a big breakthrough. So we're looking for him to, uh, to step up to, to our main event level pretty soon. Now, what, um, the, the swag. The big swag. Manager, big swag. Um, he, I, I, mean, I mean, you know, managing is like one of those things where it's, you know, it's just not in vogue, and I don't even know why it's not, but it's not. And I saw him at your show, and I mean, he had, he to me, I was very impressed with his presence at your show, just in keeping the show going, you know, when things weren't going perfect and things like that. But, you know, he's like, the problem with him as a manager, unfortunately for him, is that he's just so huge. He's so big. Yeah, no one, no one's going to be bigger than him, bar a couple guys, but... Yeah, it's just like, uh, you know, this is the big show or something. Yeah, but, but what, I, what I think Schwab does, Brett Wagner, is I think he's able, although he's so darn big, he doesn't carry his size in an intimidating fashion. No, he doesn't, but he's just physically a large person, though. Yeah, he is, but I think it actually could be used advantageously. We're, we're working on some promotional materials for Brett right now to get out to see if we can get him into an announcing position or some sort of hybrid management announcing position. Uh, you saw him. You're right. He moves stuff along fast. I really can't say... I mean, because he's, he's, he's got a great personality, I he's think. He's so fast on his feet, this guy. Yeah. And, um, oh, by the way, Dave, I need to extend an invitation to you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot on the air here. But Brett has a syndicated radio show these days called Comedy World. Mm -hmm. It's called Wrestling World. A comedy World. show? A comedy show? You should get Brian on a comedy show. I mean, I'll do it. I mean, believe me, I'll do it. Don't you know? Well, but... they they handle the comedy. They just need they they would like to have you. Oh, they need a straight yeah. man. Okay, then I'll, I'll be the straight man. <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'll tell the big swag then and 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 Joe Schmo who runs the show that uh, that you accept. And, uh, oh yeah, no problem. I'll have him give Val a call. And uh, you should have swag on your show sometime. Oh, uh, yeah, I would love to. I yeah. would love to because he's, he's, I mean, I, from the little bit I talked to him at that show and, and just watching him perform, I mean, he's a very good talker. He's funny as hell. He's very fast on his feet, and he's a real, real good guy, too. 
Rick, give, them a, call, give them a call, and uh, we can set something up. No problem. Good, good. Thank you. Yeah. So, like, yeah, uh, hopefully, hopefully Schwab will move on, too. I mean, we, we have a lot of talent here. Um, and there's, you know, not to discount the possibility that, you know, we do emerge as some sort of force, maybe, you know, maybe an ECW level or, or below that, just enough where we can actually afford to keep some people on payroll. And you'll see guys like Schwag and whatnot gain some television presence through us, which I think would be great. Now, e economically, I mean, the, fa the fact is is that basically nobody has been able to pull off the idea, the, the, the old regional promotion idea right. successfully at any level. I mean, even ECW from a... From a financial standpoint, although they had a huge cult following and, and even got to pay-per-view financially, you know, that's the reason that they're in the position they're in is because they overextend themselves. It's, you know, I mean, realistically, except for Vince McMahon, nobody's making big money in wrestling. I mean, as far as um, on the promotional end, what do you think, I mean, do you think that there's certain things that are not being exploited and kind of like you're hanging in there? I mean, what is there something that you see that, that, that can be done or mistakes that can be avoided where you could actually... Can, I mean, can a regional can a regional company be done? Is it viable? I mean, I don't know. In 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 the traditional sense, I would have to say almost absolutely not. I don't think it is. Okay. Um, if I could elaborate for a moment, I, I think we're hanging in there and we're surviving, basically based off the fact that we have two schools that are profitable under the name Ultimate University, um, and that uh, and we have a management company that is profitable. Past that, we're starting to do somewhat well with special project kind of stuff, you know, the videos and whatnot. But to go out there and think that you're going to survive or, or, or much less compete against the WWF these days is insanity. I mean, Vince, Vince owns that world. And I'm not saying that just because we, in a sense, work for him. It's a, it's a fact. He does. Uh, you know, you come to our Galaxy show and you see the sold-out crowd, you, crowd, you see people turned away. And if you start running the numbers and you see what we're paying out to put on a show like that, you'll come out at the end of the night and be amazed that we sometimes actually manage to lose money on those shows. Well, uh, I mean, I looked at I looked at your show, and I mean, I don't know what the cost of the venue, but all the things with the TV and everything, and, and I was thinking, like, you know, even though the building was packed, and, and it seemed like you do a lot, and I don't know what your cut is, you seem to do a lot of business as far as food and drinks compared to a normal wrestling show. It's right, just, just right. Just from an, ob from an observation watching it. But... Still, I mean, it just seemed like it was, I mean, with the lighting and everything, like, I mean, it was, it was a real major league pr production, it, you know, yeah. for, yes. you know, for, for, you know, that type of a level of a thing. Yeah, it, it's elaborate, and there's, there's a reason for that. I mean, here, here's the truth of the matter, and I don't really mind sharing this with people, because they all think we're getting rich out there. Um, you're there December 20th, I believe, and I recall yeah. at the end of that night, after all the expenses, we actually made a profit of like $400 that night. So mm -hmm. I basically figured out after all the people that work on putting that show together, we all made a couple cents an hour is how it turned out. <laughs> so, and that's the, those don't count the nights we lose four hundred dollars, which are which are numerous as well. But we don't mind. Those shows for us are a loss leader because we're doing it to attract people from California, you know, agents, uh, producers, um, potential business partners, strategic partners, uh, to create television, to show WWF that we're we're upping our level. That's why we do those shows. But to think that you can run house shows and actually make real money these days, I think is insanity. I haven't seen anybody do it. I know we're not doing it. I think if we get television on and we go out on the road and we keep our costs low, we might make a little bit of money. But the main reason to do something like that now would be to create product to try to do something with the product. So it's, now, it's also, a tough, tough business. Also, on, on your shows, I mean, you know, you have, you have a great atmosphere at your shows. I mean, how many shows, I mean, how long have you been running the monthly shows at the theater, and how has it grown, and is there anything you could do? Because, I mean, that was the one thing when I went to the show that I was very impressed with was it was, um, you know, it's like there's, I've, I've, I've been to independent shows where there's a lot worse wrestling for sure. I've been to independent shows where there's probably better technical wrestling, but atmosphere-wise, it pretty much blew away any independent show that I've seen as far as overall. I mean, you, you went there, and it, it felt, it did not feel independent. It felt like it was Major League, you know, the, the feel of the of the show. Yeah, thanks for the, the compliment. I appreciate that. And uh, is, is there is there more we could do? I mean, there, there's always more we can do. We're always looking. No, I, I was wondering, like, like as far as, like, in building that atmosphere at the Galaxy Theater, do you attribute it to, to anything? I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, like, because of the build, you know, the atmosphere in that building was very, was tremendous, really. Yeah, I mean, you have to attribute part of it to the building itself. I mean, it certainly beats going into to a, a Rotary Club or a high school gym, certainly. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do, obviously, with the guys and girls we have on stage. 
and an equal amount of accolades have to be given to our production crew. There's an amazing, you know, an amazing collection of people that you know, whose names you know won't mean anything to the rest of the world at large, but guys that have been with me from the beginning: Paul Baruki, John Troxell, Pete Doyle, Joe Franciosi, uh, Joe Cianoa, Kevin Quinn, Matt Kahn, I and mean, these guys are all helping us out because they love the business. You know, they're trying to make things happen, and they've become a crap, crap production squad, and it's amazing. So when you put the, our workers together with the production and the building and the fact that I think we've built a very loyal fan base, it just uh, you know, all adds up to a, uh, to a good sum. Let's go to Lars in San Francisco. Lars, what's going on? How are you doing today, Dave, Brian? Very good. Rick? Hey, Lars. Um, actually, Rick, uh, I've actually seen a lot of UPW shows courtesy of the big swag. I just want to say it's some of the best wrestling I've ever seen. Thank you and, very uh, much. I think you put out a great product. I just want to know, like so one of my I favorite tag teams, the, the Ballard Brothers. Brothers. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one of my go, favorite go ahead, tag go ahead, teams, the, the Ballard Brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think their chances are to make it? The Ballards have to do one thing before they have a chance to make it, and that is they have to, because they're twins, and that inherently is the, one of the best parts of their gimmick, is they have to get their bodies up to par to make them look like twins. You've got Shannon, who is real big, and Shane, who is real small, but they're finally starting to do it. And I've been on their butts for over a year. Um, they're very, very good in the ring. They understand the tag team game, I think, about as well as anybody working the amount of time they've been working. And they actually have a pretty cool gimmick. It's simply a matter of getting their bodies together, period. If they choose to do that, then I think they've got some pretty good chances. But that, that part is up to them. You know, the fact is, in the business today, because it's so competitive, you have to have several different assets. You have to know the ring stuff. You have to know the psychology. You have to know your way around the stick. But if you, if you put all the time into that stuff and then don't put it into your body, it ain't going to happen for you. Yeah, we talk about that all the time here. Mm-hmm. That, that, I mean, I'll, you know, we'll see guys... Um, you know that work. You know that work really, really hard. I mean, to be really good workers in the ring, but they don't have presentable bodies. And they, they, some some guys, some guys have unpresentable bodies even. And I think it's like, you know, like let's, you know, and again, you know, and this always leads to the steroid thing. And it's like, you know, like granted, you know, a lot of you know that that, that that's an issue and everything, but you can get a very presentable body and and a good body without steroids. And and it, it doesn't even take particularly an indie guy who isn't on the road all the time. Yeah, and That's it doesn't not, take. It's not, it's not that hard. Let me give you a perfect example. Chris Daniels. Here's a guy who everyone knows. And I, I think it's, it's amazing how often you saw his name on the internet as being the best unsigned guy out there. I think everyone believed that. Up until a year ago, though, Chris didn't really have the body. Now you saw Chris recently. He put yeah. it all together. Oh, he saw on TV he too. He didn't get a lot bigger. He changed his diet. He hit the gym. You know, I absolutely 100% believe it, it, Chris's physique has nothing to do with anabolics whatsoever. I haven't discussed it with him, but I've been around long enough to know what I'm looking at. And to me, it's just a, Chris is a smart guy. It's a result of knowing he had to make some changes, and, and he made it. And then there are the wrestlers who, after a, uh, you know, a show, hit Denny's and uh, you know, go for the pancakes and the ham and cheese omelets at 2 in the morning. I mean, the, 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 the whole key to me is, is if you, if you, because it's so competitive and there are so few well-paying jobs in this business, that if you want to be a wrestler, I mean, aside from learning to wrestle, which you obviously have to do, I think that you, you have to live a certain lifestyle today. I mean, then 20 years ago, you didn't have to. It is, it's a different world. But I think that you have to learn how to eat well and go to the gym. And, you know, you don't have to go to the gym three hours a day to have a good body. You can do it in an hour if you know what you're doing easily, easily. Easily. That's right. If you know what you're doing, and do it, do it with zest. I mean, not go in there and just go, oh, I got to do it. Yep. Here's ten reps. I mean, it's like you know, you got to really, you know, you got to push yourself every single workout. For but but you know, you don't have to. It's not you know, if you do that, you know, you can turn your body around, and you know, you can turn your body around, and you, and you need to. If you don't have a body, it's going to be real, real hard. I mean, even if you know, you know, acrobatic moves, and even like you know, like you've got um, what's the guy's name, Prodigy. Prodigy, yeah. Prodigy, he did a, was a shooting star off the top of a ladder? Right. Okay, and he's like 16, 17 years old. Like, a guy like that who will take risks like that, still, I mean, like, he's not also most likely going to be signed. And, and I'm not saying he has to be huge, but even like uh, Rey Mysterio, Juventud Guerrero, who are not huge men, if you really look at them, they have very good bodies for their size, and that is what 
the companies are looking for. They're not looking for, you know, a lot of flab around the middle or small arms or something. You've got to, you, you know, if you want to be a wrestler, it's just part of the game. You have yeah. to look a certain way. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's the truth. And, and Dave, you, you summarized it well. It's very competitive. And if you, if you want to make it, then you do the work to make it. It's yeah. that easy. But, I mean, to me, it's like, you know, the physical work in the ring of taking all the bumps and learning all the moves, which is, which is harder, I think. And, Brian, you would have a better idea of it than me. Because, I mean, I've, I can do the one, and I certainly can't do the other. Um, as far as, um, I mean, to me, I think that the, the training is just a matter of dedication. I mean, learning to be a good wrestler, I think, is much harder. I think it's it's much harder work than, uh, being a good worker, I think, is much harder than developing a good body. I mean, I, mean, I don't know, Brian, what, what's your thoughts? I would pretty much agree with that, because I think it's just more, you see a lot of indie guys who just have more of the desire to actually get in the ring and do that than they do to get into the gym. But if you want to go anywhere, you have to do both. Yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave let, let me agree with what you said 100% plus. I think doing the stuff in the ring is way, way harder than putting a body together in the gym. And, and Brian, you have been around it, so you'll know what I'm, I think you'll back up what I'm about to say, is if you spend two hours at a training session and you watch these guys and girls take the number of bumps that they take in a two-hour period, and then you try to extrapolate that by, you know, four nights on the road with all the travel and doing it every week, year in and year out, I think you come away pretty quickly saying these, these guys are the toughest people you're ever going to meet anywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you, you, have to be, you have to be mentally tough to make it in oh, wrestling. That, that's number one, first and foremost. Yeah. I mean, if, if you can't hang, it, it's not going to matter what kind of stuff you can do. You know, I was talking with somebody just the other night, and one of the things, you know, a lot of people, and I'll make this real quick and then we'll go to a break. The, um, you know, one of the things, you know, a lot of people go like, you know, the sports background, like football players and wrestlers and all that, that it isn't good because, you know, you get that mentality where you want to win and you don't lose well and things like that. And also, you know, there's there's certain things about projection and charisma that are not involved in, in being an amateur wrestler or a football player that you need in pro wrestling. But the one thing, if you learn, if you're an elite athlete, whether you're a football player or a wrestler or even a basketball player, and you learn the mental toughness, and certainly this is where like an amateur wrestler like a Kurt Angle comes in, and, and one of the biggest reasons why he progressed so quickly in this business is there's a certain mental toughness that you get from being as good a wrestler as he is, and you don't adapt your lack of personality that you're allowed to project in amateur wrestling to pro wrestling, but, if, but that mental toughness, if you know how to take that, and bodybuilders can have that too, um, and learn and the dedication and you transfer that into this other profession, uh, that's why I think that he was able to, uh, you know, progress like so unbelievably fast. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. They, they understand what it is to work and to work on a consistent basis. And, 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 like, when you don't feel like working, that you just do it. You have to do it. You have to get yeah, it. Yeah, like, there's, they, like, you know, like, you know, like with Tony Jones when he was on the show was going, like, you know, like when he was an amateur and it's like he got sick and he, it's sick enough that he couldn't go to school, he still went to practice because he knew it would fall behind. And that's the type of mentality you need because there's always things that come on in life that will you know, keep you from going to the gym and keep you from practicing. But it's the guys who have those same things going on in life and just say, but i got to go. And they go and they don't complain and they don't fret about it and just do it. Those are the guys who are going to succeed more often than not. Yeah, you're, you also you know, just uh, described our, uh, our, our theoretically perfect prospect. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I want to get through a couple of things before we get to phone calls and uh, and finish up with uh, with Rick. Uh, we've had a bunch of emails about this one today. So um, it's about Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Lillian Garcia. It would have been Monday after Raw ended. Brian, you want to talk about it or you want me to go through it? I just want to know what happened. They um, just yelled at her for screwing up again. She said uh, Hunter was going to choose the stipulations for WrestleMania. And she said he no way out. Just. Or she said WrestleMania was supposed to be No Way Out, and he just... Right, it was supposed to be No Way Out, and she said WrestleMania by accident. She made a mental error, and he went ballistic on her. Which I assume was uh, legitimate. I believe it was legitimate, yeah. And I guess the mic kept cutting out, but if you remember earlier on the show, Al Snow was trying to cut a promo, and he was using a mic that kept cutting out, so I don't know if somebody was doing this to Hunter or not, but... Uh... But, but he, he thought Kevin Dunn was, was cutting him out. Yeah. So he was mad at Kevin Dunn, too. I mean, the only thing that I that I think of is, if he was really chewing her out, why would he do it over the house mic, and why would they not cut his mic? Well, maybe they did. And why? And, and, and if it was, um, I don't know, if it was an angle, why do it after TV was over? I just don't get it. Yeah. Uh, this is from Richard, who says, uh, you mentioned the DDT is an easy move to take. 
maybe to the guy who receives it, for the guy who performs it in the long run takes a beating. Arn Anderson, Michael Hayes, and Jake Roberts were top, probably the top three guys who used the DDT over the past 20 years, and all three wound up with bad necks and bad backs. It's very uh, interesting. I don't think it's from delivering DDTs. That would just be my opinion. Okay. Just a back bump. Um... Well, Michael Hayes had a bad back long before he ever before the DDT was even invented because he had a bad back like in the late seventies from taking bumps, and he didn't, and the DDT wasn't even popularized till the mid eighties. Jake, you know, God only knows how Jake could have gotten. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and Arn, Arn, as I recall, Arn got his problems from uh, working too many matches against the Steiner brothers. Yeah. I mean, when the, when they were breaking in and they were like literally killers, and you know, they used to always. They used to always work with him with uh, various partners, with uh, Zabisco and Bobby Eaton and, and Ole. This is for uh, Rick. Uh, what's the latest on Tom Howard? Uh, okay. Tom is Tom essentially is my partner these days. He's in the office full time. He's up the street editing our pilot right now. Um, he is officially or unofficially retired from the ring, aside from uh, doing our isn't he, shows. Is, isn't he? Re you know, he's re okay because he's wrestling Wednesday night. Yeah, he is wrestling Wednesday. He's in the uh, the main event, the uh, Tom Howard, Mikey Henderson, and Chris Daniels against uh, Donovan Morgan, uh, Mike Modest, and uh, and Tony Jones. Yeah, but Tom's doing his shots just with us. Otherwise, he's uh, in the office full time, doing an amazing job, running our commercial and theatrical division, running the video division, and uh, just uh, basically we're hanging out, taking care of business. You know. Um now, did he have a chance to go to Memphis and turn it down because he didn't want to go there, or what? How did, how did that? Because I mean, I remember hearing about you know him and Gangrel as a tag team, and then it, and I, I talked to him briefly at the show, and he just uh, kind of gave me the impression, you know, he didn't really like, we didn't really talk about it in any depth, but I kind of got the impression that, you know, he was sort of ambivalent about it, I guess, maybe, well, the whole or even less than ambivalent. Yeah, the whole situation was kind of like a shades of gray sort of thing. The, there was never a definite offer to do it, although it was discussed and, and pretty much pretty much put out there. Tom had just moved, just had a, uh, a new baby, and wasn't jazzed about moving to Memphis with all the, uh, you know, the wife and kids at home. And then uh, Gangrel, I think, had some health problems. So it was just yeah. a, a matter of timing. It just didn't ever quite come to pass. It wasn't that the offer was made and it wasn't that it was turned down. It just didn't quite uh, materialize. This is something from England. Uh, this is from Ben Craig. who says, Tonight there was a major wrestling piece on ITV here in the United Kingdom. The lengthy segment was on uh, Tonight with Trevor McDonald, which is a highly rated primetime current affairs show. The focus was entirely on the effect wrestling has on kids. Two American cases were mentioned, the Lionel Tate case and Jason Whaler. Uh, there was a tape of Jason Whaler ringing for an ambulance because his 19-month-old brother wasn't breathing and was covered in blood. Later, he told the police he repeatedly had powerbombed the child because Kevin Nash was his favorite wrestler because he's cool and over seven feet tall. I never heard that part of that story. I didn't either. I mean... I mean, I certainly heard the the power bomb part of it. I never heard the Kevin Nash thing. Did he? If he mentioned that to the police, then that's a lot stronger than. I don't think he did because because that was one of the cases that was on Court TV. And if they had something where there was actually a connection with Kevin Nash and all that, it's a lot stronger story. I got a feeling that I don't know. I don't. I just don't know. I'll just leave it that. Uh, there were also English kids who went nearly went blind from a kick and a kid who broke his neck in a headlock. Uh, there were also psychologists saying it's terrible. Uh, well, anything done stupidly is terrible. And that it portrayed violence without consequences. Chris Cruz was featured saying he's totally against wrestling now. Does he really say that? We have been in the show a couple times. Uh, because of heroes being Austin and Rock. Well, I mean, I know what Chris is against, you know, because he, he thinks that they're bad role models to kids because of the language. Uh, British wrestling shows were portrayed as friendly and nonviolent. Marginetti and the head shrinker uh, uh, were shown... On this non-violent footage that someone took a brutal Death Valley driver, there was a distinction made between WF and WCW. The main footage was of the Foley-Helmsley match, the Helm the Cell match, and a Sting commercial. Finally, they said, a study of wrestling's effects on children is being published next month. And they ended by saying Channel 4, which shows he and four of the pay-per-views a year, are going to start heavily monitoring the content of the WF shows. So expect more editing of those four WF pay-per-views that are on Channel 4. And also on heat. In fact, we even heard about that from the story earlier in the week. So anyway, so uh, that's there. Seventy-five percent of you in the UK that watch all three major shows. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Mike in Oklahoma. Mike, what's going on? Uh, yeah, Rick. Hey, Mike. Uh, I was just wanting to give thumbs up for the UPW shows. 
Thank you. Thank of course, you. I live in Oklahoma, and <laughs> there's no way possible I can go to the UPW shows. But cool. uh, I watch I watch them on the internet. Very good. Watch again next Wednesday night. 21st. I can't hear you. Uh, the twenty first oh, next Wednesday we're on yeah. again. Yeah, yeah next Wednesday on at eleven Eastern, eight Pacific. Good. And uh, give that give that fat son of a bitch kicking ass for me. Oh, uh, that's why I'm trying to do something <laughs> on him. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> An airplane spin will be good enough. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fun. And uh, I was also wanting to ask about oh, uh, uh, I think he's what's his last Mark Mark uh, Callis or something like that. Who? The Mark. guy that went to prison. Oh, the guy who went to prison in your in the in the Discovery Channel show. Oh, 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 Mark Callis. The, the shoot the shoot fighter guy. Yeah. I forgot his name. Uh, Matt Matt Hall. Matt Hall, right. Matt Hall, yeah, I don't know why I couldn't remember his name. Yeah, Matt, uh, Matt unfortunately is still there, and he, he won't be yeah. out for at least three years. You I've know, been he, reading, he's, uh... He's doing you know, a minimum sentence. ...things that he writes on your on your uh, website, but... Yeah, and we've had uh, no luck getting updates because he's not able to get that stuff out, unfortunately. He's in maximum security. He did, uh... He's in maximum security? Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, he sure is. And, uh, he did get married recently, though, to, uh... Mm-hmm. To my ex assistant, who you you also can catch a glimpse of on the Discovery special, the uh, blonde girl. If you remember the scene coming out of the courthouse, the blonde girl walking down the stairs with myself and Basil actually ended up marrying Matt uh, about a year ago while he was in prison. Wow! So there, there, there's the uh, huh. the finale to that story, at least for the time being. Well, and uh, Dave, I was also wanting to ask you something. Sure. Uh, have you heard anything about who uh, Raven's driver is? Uh, you mean the, that story? Is that who it is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. All righty. Uh, I just wanted to say hey to Rick. And Thanks a lot, Mike. I'll let Appreciate some other callers get through. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, as far as uh, what, you're, as far as uh, aside from the Galaxy Theater stuff, or do you have any other shows scheduled, or is that pretty much the main thing you're doing now? Yeah, as we're going to be going to the uh, the House of Blues in both Los Angeles and Las Vegas beginning in March. Uh, oh, we're really? Going to be go- Pardon me? Oh, that, yeah, that'd be fun. House of Blues in Las Vegas. Now, I... Mandalay Bay. Okay, because I, I was in Vegas a couple months ago, and I know I walked by it, so this is Mandalay Bay. Yes, yeah. it's in the Mandalay Bay. A great, it's a great room. should be a lot of fun. be very similar looking to our Galaxy show due to the production. They have built-in house and whatnot. We, we're, we're hitting the road a couple of times. We're going up north. Um, that's the name, of, the name of a city that escapes me. It's not Vallejo. Um, there's a town coming up. And we're also going to go to uh, Alaska in April, just for one shot. But um, What? Yeah. <laughs> yes, promoters in Alaska want to bring us out to do a it's shot. It's only going to be one shot, though? Two shows in one night. Okay. Should be interesting. Uh, you know, wow. The, the truth is, Daniel, <laughs> what, what we're trying to do in a nutshell is to create content and create product and find different ways to get it out there. Um, not a lot of upside right now in us going out to do live shows just to do them. There really has to be a good reason for it. So um, you know, as, as we develop those reasons or as they develop on their own, we'll probably probably go out more often. Have you seen any wrestling thoughts? in Alaska? I have no idea. I, I, don't I don't have think I've ever seen a result from there. Um, very rare. Because I, I remember when there was a show, somebody said it was like the first show in many years there. There was a show a couple years back. I think huh. WWF went there like in the 80s. And WCW, I know, has never been there. Yeah, we're going out short crew, just 14 of us, and that's in April. But, uh, you know, we're taking, taking most of our top guys and a couple of the girls, so that should be fun. Do you have any do thoughts? a live remote from Alaska, who knows. Um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, Dave, if I, if I had a quick second here. Sure, go ahead. Let people know again on our website, upw.com. We're starting new classes at the school all the time. We've now signed uh, 15 people. Uh, 10 guys and 5 girls out of our school have gone on to get contracts. And uh, a lot of them are developing. Lisa Marie Varon, who's out in Tennessee, is doing amazingly well. In, uh, she's going to be wrestling Sunday on one of the WF house shows. Yeah, she's right. She's got a, uh, a house show match with uh, Kat on Sunday. Exactly. And uh, Lisa Marie's doing great. I think you'll see her on TV a lot sooner rather than later. Um, wanted to thank RVD and Nova, both for being out recently at our shows. Awesome guys. Nova is an amazing talent, in, um, at least in my opinion. And uh, definitely see him going places. And wanted to thank those guys for the nice words on, uh, on their website about us. Kind of like the same stuff you said, Dave, about our show and 
with the feeling is backstage and so on and so forth, and especially to Jr. who had some real, real nice words on uh, the Ross report for us oh, yeah. last week. What's uh, as far as far as Van Dam? What's I mean, what, what's your thoughts as far as it was pretty much a one-time thing? I mean, do you want him again, or is the price too high, or is this one of those things where you're still talking about bringing him back for other shows? Uh, all of the above, <laughs> yeah, all of the above. It it, it, ha- it would have to make sense for us. I like Rob. He lives locally, which is great. He uh, he comes to a lot of our shows. He drops by the school um, on occasion, and I'd love to have him on the show again. But it really should be saved for um, you no know, more of a special type of occasion. We do have mm. uh, we do have Nova coming back the next three shows though, which I'm real excited about. Really? Yeah. Next three shows. Um, so so you got uh, Richards, Ivory, and Nova as the big as the big stars on the 21st. Yep, along with uh, with our own homegrown stars, of course. Uh, I think. What's really shaping up, though, to be the main event, oddly enough, is uh, is the uh, the SoCal No Cal Six Man. Seems to be a mm-hmm. lot of, lot of good heat for it. Is there any like uh, you know as far as like upcoming dates uh, with like any WF talent that's coming up? Uh, you know, like any of the bigger names that come in. Like you've had Angle in, you had Helmsley in, mm-hmm. uh, people like that. Any, any any talk with them as far as like you know, big star coming in like in the next couple months? Yeah, March 14th. We should have one very, very big name, if not more than that. And uh, I do believe on that date that um, that uh, JR and uh, Paul Bearer and some other guys should be in attendance as well. So we'll be pulling out all the stops on that show and uh, probably be headlining with um, with one of their very big names and maybe two. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. And I, we're, we're talking about specific people. We'll see how that turns out. Um, you know, WWF has always been real, real helpful with us when we uh, when we need to bring somebody in. So uh, it should be some good stuff. And okay, we are totally out of time, Rick. I want to thank you very much, and you can get back to that production. And I, I really, I really want to see a tape, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people in Southern California want to see a television show. Yeah, as soon as it's uh, done, so we'll send it out to you. 